we pray. O merciful Lord, who desires worshipers who will honor you in spirit and in truth, send your spirit to cleanse us from dead works to serve you in righteousness and holiness and to honor your great and saving name for giving us Jesus, who is the expression of your special eternal love unto salvation to everyone who believes. We ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. begin our worship service this morning in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. O Lord, open my lips. Make haste, O God, to deliver me. joined to make confession of our sins using the words of the Apostle John found in your bulletin. God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If 
If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Let us pray together. Almighty God, merciful Father, I am sinful by nature and have sinned against you in my thoughts, words, and actions. But I am sorry for my transgressions, and I pray you of your bountiful mercy to be gracious and merciful unto me. Forgive me for Jesus' sake. Renew me by your Spirit and lead me in the way everlasting. Amen. God, our Heavenly Father, has forgiven you all your sins. By the perfect life and the innocent death of our Lord Jesus Christ, he has removed your guilt forever. You are his own dear child. May the Lord, who has begun this good work in you, bring it to completion in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. with you. Please be seated. The epistle reading for this Sunday is found recorded in Paul's letter to the Romans in chapter 1, verses 16 through 25. During our service today, our focus will be on the fact that God can be known and seen, both in creation, but more specifically through his word. Our first reading for this morning reminds us of that truth that God can be known in the world around us, that there is no excuse for anyone to say that I don't know God or God didn't give enough evidence that he exists. The evidence for God's existence is found all over in the world around us. We read from Romans chapter 1, beginning with verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools, and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and birds, and four-footed animals, and creeping things. Therefore God also gave them up to uncleanness in the lusts of their heart, to dishonor their bodies among themselves, who exchanged the truth of God for the lie, and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator, 
who is blessed forever. Amen. Alleluia, alleluia. There is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom to be testified for all in due time. Alleluia. Please rise for our gospel reading. Our gospel reading for this morning actually is taken from the book of Acts, one of the other historical books of the New Testament, chapter 17, verses 22 through 31. In these verses from the book of Acts, we are again taken back to the existence of God. On one of Paul's trips to the city of Athens, he was confronted with an opportunity to proclaim the one true God to a culture that believed in many gods. We see how Paul did this and pointed to the one true God in the verses of our gospel reading. Then Paul stood in the midst of the Areopagus and said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are very religious. For as I was passing through and considering the objects of your worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, to the unknown God. Therefore, the one whom you worship without knowing, him I proclaim to you. God, who made the world and everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything, since he gives to all life, breath, and all things. And he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on the face of the earth, and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings, so that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. As also some of your own poets have said, for we also are his offspring. Therefore, since we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, something shaped by art and man's devising. Truly, these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent, because he has appointed a day on, on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. He has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. Here ends our gospel reading. We join to make confession boldly of our faith and that faith that was proclaimed by the Apostle Paul in the one true God and the one whom he has raised from the dead, we'll be using the words of the Apostles' Creed on page 12 in your hymnal. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the holy Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated.
grace, mercy, and peace be to each one of you in the name of our Savior God as well as our Creator. The words of God which we are considering this morning which emphasize this truth are found in the words of the psalmist in Psalm 19. To the chief musician, a psalm of David. The heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament shows his handiwork. Day unto day utters speech, and night unto night reveals knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line has gone out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them he has set a tabernacle for the sun, which is like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, and rejoices like a strong man to run its race. Its rising is from one end of heaven and its circuit to the other end, and there is nothing hidden from its heat. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them your servant is warned, and in keeping them there is great reward. Who can understand his errors? Cleanse me from secret faults. Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and I shall be innocent of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. This is the word of our God. Please be seated. In the name of our Savior and Creator God, evidence for whom can be found all around us in this world and in His Word, dear fellow redeemed. There's an account that is told of an interview between a reporter and a very renowned atheist. They were discussing all types of things, and finally the issue of God finally came up. The reporter asked the atheist, if you died and you stood before God and found out that he really does exist after denying him for all these years, what would you tell him? The atheist replied, I would tell him that he didn't give me enough evidence to believe that he existed. What a striking reply. And yet it's one that is often repeated by those who deny the existence of God. And a reply that the Apostle Paul in our scripture reading earlier told us won't hold any water when we stand before God on the last day. The Apostle Paul says God has given all the evidence that is necessary that he exists so that we as human beings are without excuse. Over the last few weeks, we have been considering a series from the book of Psalms. Once again, this morning, we take up a study of one of the Psalms. And as we do, it's Valuable to realize that what we read in the Psalms is not new and it's not old. It's the same thing that God has proclaimed throughout his word. What God revealed in the book of Romans about the existence of God, what the Apostle Paul proclaimed in Athens was also proclaimed by David almost a thousand years earlier. David proclaims, that the glory of God is all around us. It is revealed first by nature. 
but it is more fully revealed through the truth of God's word. We pray that the Holy Spirit would bless us in our meditation and strengthen our faith in this truth that God does exist, that he can be known because he has revealed himself to us. Amen. There are several parts to this psalm, and I tried to divide it up in your bulletin in a way that emphasizes the divisions of the psalmist. We're going to begin by taking a look at the first six verses of this psalm in which David emphasizes that God can and is known in nature. I remember not long after coming to Sleepy Eye, Deborah and I would go around town, we'd go for a walk just to get to know the town a little bit. And our walks would often take us to the new side of town. And at that time, they were building a house right on the corner. Our walks were usually in the evening. But every day that we would go by that house, we'd see some changes. One day they had the walls set up. The next day the trusses were on. The next day it was sheeted. The next day they had sheeting on the walls. Now, we didn't ever see anybody there, but we would see a dwindling pile of materials on one side of the lot that would be added to the building. The writer to the Hebrews says, every house is built by someone, but the one who has built all things is God. Now, only a fool would go by that house day after day and say, oh, wow, that's pretty amazing. All of these materials are just flying onto the building all by themselves. Even though we never saw the contractor at work, we knew that the contractor had been there when we weren't watching. And yet how foolish it also is to look at the world that we live in and say, oh, wow, it's pretty amazing to see how all of this just comes together. There is no builder, no creator. The psalmist tells us in the opening verse of our text, the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament shows his handiwork. The creation itself is an unspoken sermon about the glory of God and his existence. It doesn't have to say a word. By its very existence, it proclaims there is a creator, one who has placed creation here. The glory of the stars, the wonder of the heavens and the universe around us, all of it proclaims the glory of God. Now that creation, in and of itself, condemns unbelief, doesn't it? Just like the one who would be a fool walking by that house and believing that it doesn't have a contractor, that there's no one who's there putting it together day in and day out, so also the unbelief, the rejection of God, is condemned by the very creation of the world of which we are a part. The creation proclaims God's glory in a language that is unspoken but understood by every living being. In verse 2, David says, Day unto day utters speech, and night unto night reveals knowledge. This unspoken sermon is proclaimed day in and night out. There is no time when the glory of God is not being revealed by the creation. And then in verse 3, he says, There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line has gone out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. That unspoken sermon by creation is understood in every language, every civilization, every place where people exist. It doesn't have to be translated. It doesn't have to be converted. It is by itself a proclamation of God's glory. In the final verses, this, uh, David speaks about what kind of an effect this has. He says, in them, that is the creation, the heavens and the firmament, he has set a tabernacle for the sun, which is like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, 
and rejoices like a strong man to run its race. Its rising is from one end of heaven and its circuit to the other. There is nothing hidden from its heat. <clears throat> Who can say, God hasn't given me enough evidence to believe that he exists? The psalmist also says, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Because the evidence that God exists is everywhere around us. Now, this natural knowledge of God, which we receive from creation, is a powerful thing. It is a proclamation that everybody in the world can see and can understand. But while it is powerful, it is also limited in power. How is it limited? While it proclaims a God that does indeed exist, a God that is powerful, a God that is wise, a God that is intelligent, it doesn't specifically tell us who that God is. If you've ever thought about it, throughout the history of the world and all of the different religions that exist, atheism is just a small percentage of all of that. Now, although atheists will say that they don't believe that God exists, they do make a God. They do have a God that they believe in ignorantly. In reality, atheists have made themselves a God in their own eyes. They are the maker, the creator, the ruler of their own little universe. But all of these religions of the world that proclaim a God proclaim a God because of the natural knowledge of God. They understand by looking at creation, yes, there is a God. It's foolish to say otherwise. The problem is that they're confused about who that God is. They call the creator God by different names. And yet the knowledge of that God is small. It's incomplete. The creation reveals God as creator, as powerful, as wise, as intelligent. But it does not reveal to the world God as redeemer. You can take a look at the creation around you, at the universe of which we are a part, the sun, the moon, the stars. You can take a look at the wonders of nature on this earth that God has designed for the very purpose of being a place where human beings can live and thrive. But nature does not proclaim God in, it, in his fullness as our redeemer. God has given the natural knowledge that he exists for a reason, so that there would be no excuse if you think back to the Apostle Paul's proclamation in Acts chapter 17, he told the believers and the unbelievers there in Athens that God it reveals himself through nature so that we might seek after God. If we know from nature that God exists, the intent that God has is that we might seek him, find him, know more about him. By nature, we want to know more about this God who is great, who is powerful, who is wise but who God is in his fullness is only revealed, not in nature, but in his word. We move on to verses 7 and following in our text where David emphasizes this true, what we call the revealed knowledge of God, where God reveals himself to human beings fully through his word. We read verses 7, 8, and 9. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise and simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. If you pay close attention to those three verses, you'll, know a, you'll notice a pattern. 
There are six names, law, testimony, statutes, commandment, fear, and judgments, which are parallels, building one upon the, on another. There are six attributes that describe God's word, perfect, sure, right, pure, clean, and true. And finally, there are six blessings that come from exposure to God's precious word. This law converts the soul. His testimony makes wise the simple. His statutes bring joy, rejoicing to the heart. His commandment enlightens our eyes. His fear endures forever, and his judgments are righteous altogether. These four names, law, testimony, statute, or six names, law, testimony, statutes, commandment, fear, and judgments are all synonymous with God's word. His law is found proclaimed in the word. His testimony, his statutes, his commandment, his fear, his judgments, all of that is proclaimed in God's word. And the psalmist tells us that the, this word is great. It is perfect. It is sure. It is correct. It is pure without error. It is clean and it is true. And it brings with it great blessings. The converting of the soul of the human nature, the sinful human being. It brings wisdom to human beings, joy, it gives us understanding, enlightening our eyes. It's the kind of thing that isn't here today and gone tomorrow. Rather, it endures forever, and it is righteous altogether. <clears throat> These terms describe for us the whole of God's word. Many times when we hear words like law and commandments, we think of that one part of God's word, the bad news, the you shall and you shall not. But it's broader than that. It's all that God has revealed and proclaimed to us as human beings. Yes, his law in the Ten Commandments is right. It is pure. It does endure forever. But so also does that gospel message that God has revealed to us about who he is and what he has done in the person and the work of the Christ promised in the Old Testament and fulfilled in the person and work of Jesus Christ. Both God's law and his gospel is wonderful, beautiful, and what is necessary in order to bring us to an understanding of God, not only as our creator, but as our redeemer. It is only through the word of God that we as sinful human beings who can look at nature and know that God exists can finally come to an understanding of who the true God really is. We can go out and we can look at the tree outside. We can look at the amazing intricacy of just how far the earth is away from the sun and that it rotates at the perfect distance so that we aren't burned up or frozen to death. And yet, those things don't say, Jesus is your savior. The greatest thing that God has done for us is not creating us and creating this world around us, but more importantly, redeeming us from sin and from death converting us from that natural image, the rejection of God, and bringing us to know who he is, to give us true wisdom in the one who is wisdom, and that is Jesus Christ. Only this revealed knowledge of God imparts the true wisdom, which points us to a savior God, a one who has delivered us from death and the devil. As David looks at this wonder of God's revealed knowledge in his word, he continues in verse 10 saying, More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. 
Moreover, by them your servant is warned, and in keeping them there is great reward. David says that this revealed knowledge, his word, is the most precious thing of all. He says it's more precious than gold. It's sweeter than honey. It's the thing that we as human beings need more than anything else in this life. And we should desire it, want more of it. He says, by them your servant is warned. We are reminded that God as our creator is against us and our sin. That he does judge sin because he hates sin. But also he says in keeping them there is great reward. As we look at the law of God and we compare ourselves to that law of God, we find certain things out. David says, who can understand his errors? Well, truly, we can only understand our errors in the light of God's truth, can't we? Well, he has given us a conscience that recognizes that when we do something wrong, we feel guilt. When we do something that is right, we feel com comforted, encouraged. But David says, who can understand his errors? Cleanse me from secret faults. Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. And then I shall be blameless, and I shall be innocent of great transgression. Consider the words that David uses to describe his condition as he considers this great creator and redeemer God. He's full of error, secret faults, sin, presumptuous sins that have dominion over him, and he is guilty of great transgression. It's not a very pleasant picture, is it? If we know God only as creator, as the judge, as the powerful being that put us all here, it's a scary thing. It's a frightening thing to fall into the hands of the living God, the Bible tells us. We need to know God as more than just our creator in order to live lives not in fear, but in joy. We also need to know God as our redeemer. He says, keep back your servant from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and shall be innocent of great transgression. God, our creator God, is more than just our creator. He has solved the problem of our sin, our great sin, our transgression, our error. Through Christ, we are found blameless, innocent, as Christ clothes us with his righteousness. The psalmist closes with this beautiful prayer. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. David doesn't get a lot into that topic of redemption. He touches on it, he alludes to it, but he proclaims it very loudly in that final verse as he proclaims the creator God as his strength and his redeemer. The one who has made him blameless, innocent before God, even though he was full of sin. David's strength and his redeemer is also our strength and our redeemer. That God who is great, who has created the world, who can be known in the creation, his works all around us, even in our own bodies, is greater even than that. He has revealed himself as our redeemer. We come to know this through the precious teachings of his word, which make us wise which convert our souls and enlighten our eyes. Thanks be to God that he has given us his word, that he didn't leave us only with the natural knowledge that he exists so that we would be without excuse, but more importantly that he carefully throughout history has revealed himself to us as the Redeemer God, the one who through his son has forgiven our sins and made us blameless in his eyes. 
may we continue, like David, to serve as witnesses also of his redemption, just as the creation proclaims his strength and his power. May the words of our mouths and the meditation of our hearts also be acceptable to our God as we proclaim this truth. In Jesus' name, amen. And the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen.
we pray. O Lord, all goodness comes from you. You are holy, and holy is your name. Heaven and earth are full of your glory. The sun, the moon, the planets, and stars all bear witness to your wisdom and your power. All the energy and the forces of nature and the universe, the sea and the clouds, the thunder and the lightning, the earth and all that is in it are your creation, your servants and your messengers to us of your wonder and might. Yes, O Lord, the firmament shows forth your handiwork. Day unto day utters speech and night unto night shows forth knowledge. All things seen and unseen are a testimony to your rule and your reign. We thank you especially for the testimony of the created world to your power. But even more so, we praise you for the sure word of light and truth in your holy scriptures. Grant that your true word given to us through the prophets and apostles may always lead and guide us into the light of your grace and the promise of the glorious light to come. Dear Jesus, you are truly the best gift from heaven. For in your birth, you took upon yourself our flesh, and in your death, you took upon yourself our sins. In your resurrection, you have guaranteed our own rising from the grave to life eternal. Give us always your word and truth and all the mercies of your sacrifice for us that we may be raised to newness of life. By the power of your spirit, enable us to do away with the lusts of our flesh and our lives, putting away hatred and bitterness and overcoming all sinful habits that we might walk according to your word and will. O spirit of the living God, you have established your church, bringing us to spiritual life through the law and the gospel of your inspired word. Grant that we may bring unto you in word and action all the fruits of righteousness. Let our whole lives sound forth your praise for calling us out of darkness into your marvelous light. Give the light of life, O Lord, to all the peoples of the earth, that they may put away their sin, acknowledge Jesus as Lord and Savior, and walk before you in faith and obedience. Give also to the leaders of our own country whose consciences are tuned to your voice and citizens whose hearts are fixed on doing your will the ability to carry that out. O oh God, our Creator, our King, and our Holy Spirit, help us now during the days of this earthly life and in the time of our death, preserve us for your eternal kingdom. Through Jesus Christ, your only begotten Son, our Lord, we ask this and also this prayer in which we bring to you in his presence. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. <clears throat> Receive with believing hearts the blessing and the promise of our creator and redeemer God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Mm -hmm.